Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Collaborative Science for Estuaries webinar series. My name is Nick Soberall. I'm a member of the Near Science Collaborative staff. We're glad you can join us today for our last webinar of 2019 titled Leveraging NEARS Monitoring Program Data for Wetland Research and Management. The webinar today is part of a monthly webinar series that features research, integrated assessment, and science transfer projects funded by the NEARS Science Collaborative. Webinars also feature projects from science collaborative team members as they engage the reserve system. The National Estuarine Research Reserve System, or NEARS, is a network of 29 unique research reserves as shown on this map. This is a NOAA program that works in collaboration with a local place-based partner, either a state agency, university, or nonprofit. Each reserve site includes programs focused on land stewardship, research, and scientific monitoring, training programs for public and local officials, and education. The Near Science Collaborative is one of the research funding mechanisms for the reserve system. In addition to providing grants, we also work to promote the research and engagement happening across the reserve system through webinars like today's. Today's webinar will feature two projects that have been analyzing monitoring data from multiple sites to better understand trends in marsh surface elevation and vegetation in relation to sea levels. Chris Kincaid will start with a brief intro to monitoring in the reserve system, and then we'll transition to presentations from two featured projects that have been developing new ways to analyze and utilize wetland monitoring data. Finally, we'll end with some comments from Dwayne Porter before moving to the Q&A session. We'll begin the presentation shortly, but first we just have a few housekeeping items to address. Due to the large audience we have with us today, you are muted upon entry and we will be handling questions via the question feature on the GoToWebinar console. Questions will be saved for the Q&A portion of the webinar. However, we encourage you to submit your questions as they occur to you throughout the webinar by entering them into the questions field on the webinar console. Before we get started with the panel, we'd like to, we'd like to get a better sense for who's with us today by asking a few polling questions. Please respond when you see the poll at your screen. Looks like we've got a pretty diverse audience with us today. That's good to see. We always love seeing diversity in our audiences. We've got one more quick poll question before we get started with the actual presentations. So we'll go ahead and launch that right now. Once again, a lot of diversity here in our responses. Always good to see. Thank you for your responses to our polling questions. We'll start the presentation with Chris Kincaid from NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Chris is the National Research Coordinator for the Reserve System, and he'll be providing us with some background on the monitoring program in the Reserve System. Chris, I'll hand the floor over to you now. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, given that survey and seeing that about 60% of us are either new to uh, looking at monitoring data of the reserves, we thought we'd take a couple minutes giving some background. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve established our system-wide monitoring program, or SWAMP, in 1995, with its primary mission to develop quantitative measurements of short-term variability and long-term changes in the water quality, biological systems, and land use and land cover characteristics of estuarine ecosystems to inform effective coastal zone management. 
I know it sounds like a lot, and that's my air quotes reading off the page, but the monitoring program was designed to address some fundamental questions. We want to know how environmental conditions and biological systems vary in space and time within the network of near sites. We want to know how ecosystem structure and function varies through space and time within critical nearest habitats. And to what extent are changes in estuarine ecosystems represented in the reserve system attributable to natural variability versus anthropogenic activity? So to do this, the reserves collect a suite of water quality, meteorological, nutrient, and pigment parameters. Swamp data are collected at sites using standardized protocols and equipment at multiple fixed locations in every reserve you see on the map. Given that the research reserves are sentinels for early detection of environmental change in response to stressors to enable timely management responses, a recent focus has been on investigating how changes in local water levels impact coastal vegetated habitat. So in addition to our weather and water quality parameters, many reserves are being monitored for water levels with their associated vertical control networks, marsh elevation changes through surface elevation tables, and the associated vegetation community changes. And so you'll hear more about some of the syntheses of these parameters in the two projects that Kim, David, and Chris will be talking about shortly. Nick, can we go to the next slide? But first, a quick um, public service announcement for about our NEARS data management. So our system-wide monitoring program data are managed and served by the NEARS Centralized Data Management Office, or CDMO. The CDMO ensures that our NEARS data have a high level of quality assurance and are easily accessible on a public website. And if you go to the CDMO, web, CDMO website, whose link you can see there at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that CDMO also helpfully provides web-based graphing applications to help with interpretation and analysis of swamp data. So if you're getting, if you're new to the system and want to see what types um, and duration of monitoring data we have, this is the place to go. So I highly encourage you to go visit. Nick, that's all I have. Back to you. Great, thanks, Chris. Thanks for that background on the NERS monitoring program and how it has evolved to meet current management challenges. Next up is Kim Cressman from the Grand Bay Reserve in Mississippi. Kim is a system-wide monitoring program coordinator for her reserve. Over the past year, Kim has been leading a team that represents a number of reserves across the system, and we're really excited to see some of the tools and results that are emerging. Kim, thanks for being with us today. I'll take a moment to switch to your presentation here real quick. Thank you, Nick. So we are working with data from 15 different reserves. And once the presentation's going, y'all will be able to see on a map. But we're working with surface elevation table data to help make it a little bit easier for NEARS and others to work with it. There's been a lot of interest in the project and a lot of external stakeholders too. So it's, it's been really end user driven and really great. Uh, next slide, please. Our overall goal is to make it easier to work with these data. There's not really a standardized way, at least not within the NEARS, to manage and analyze surface elevation table data. So we're trying to make strides in that direction as a system, and the timing of this project is helping us move that forward by doing some data formatting and coming up with a standardized format that we have transformed data into from all of these reserves. We have also created interactive tools for QAQC so that you can visualize and interact with your data and maybe find outliers, make sure that it's good, high quality data before you run it through your analyses, which I'm not gonna be talking about that particular portion today, but it's, it's been a major part of it. And then developing tools for easy analyses and communication for the users of set data. Next slide. For those of you who aren't familiar with surface elevation tables, they're a way that we can really precisely measure the marsh surface and where it is. That collar in the bottom center of the uh, diagram on your screen is a permanent installation on the marsh, and then this arm that's sticking up over it is something that's taken out every time you get measurements. Typically, there are four different directions that you measure. And then, next slide, Nick, and this is going to show the pins, the measurements that you take are how far the pins stick up above that arm. And that's a proxy for where the surface is. And it's all relative to essentially your first reading, although you can also relate it back to NAVD88 and other vertical uh, datums. 
but the idea is typically you have nine pins on an arm, four different positions, so you have 36 measurements on any given date, and then you measure that over time and can look for changes. Next slide. The biggest questions that people ask with surface elevation table are, first of all, how is the marsh surface changing over time, and does it keep up with sea level rise? So these are two of the big things that we're looking at. Probably the main output that our users care about is going to be a Microsoft Word document. The background of all of this is that I'm programming a lot of things in R so that people who aren't familiar with R but can enter data can run these things and easily generate this report without too much extra headache. So the analyses, any tables that result, any statistics, and any graphics are in this Microsoft Word document where we can also provide some background wording for what's gone into it, but the end user can change it really easily. If they don't like the graph that's on that page, you can just delete it easily. You don't have to, to worry about our code. So it's a very graphics heavy project, but keep in mind everything you're about to see is also going to just be produced in Microsoft Word and very often saved out as picture files as well, so they can be used in different settings. Next. This is a graphic from just a single surface elevation table where I averaged the pin readings for each individual date. So there's just one point per date on this graph. That light gray line in the background is the actual averaged data compared to the first reading. The blue line is a linear trend describing that data. And then the red line is the, the line that has the same slope as sea level rise. And the idea of this graphic is you can see if, how those slopes compare because we're worried about sets keeping up with sea level rise. Next. So you want to know if the lines are generally parallel or not. Keep in mind, this will also be produced in a tabular format, but the, that would make for a less interesting webinar. So this is the graphic version of it. Next. We can also compile this as just a single graphic for the whole reserve, so you can see at a glance how your sets compare. So at the reserve level, this will all be produced. Okay, next. This is another one of our key graphics that's a summary of the change at surface elevation tables at a single reserve. The x-axis here is rate of change. And the y-axis is categorical. That's just one line for each of our surface elevation tables. So this is a single reserve. The red dot is the calculated rate of change at each set, and the whiskers are the 95% confidence interval. We have a vertical line to represent zero, a vertical line to represent sea level rise. So you can see at a glance, maybe your surface elevation table is, uh, the elevation is increasing but it's not increasing as fast as sea level rise, and that's pretty important to know. The other thing about this graphic is that sea level rise is also an estimate. We use NOAA's calculated estimates and confidence intervals. So the confidence interval is that blue shading on the graphic. Next. So the way that we're proceeding with comparing surface elevation change to sea level rise is essentially do the confidence intervals from the set calculation overlap with that confidence interval of sea level rise. And a, a graphic that I'm not showing you is we can put these on a map at the reserve level so you can see spatial patterns within your reserve. And we also have some regional and national maps that I'll show you to kind of summarize graphically. So the color coding is important here. When it's a dark red, we're saying, oh, it's below sea level rise or in some graphics zero, but for this presentation, sea level rise. And the confidence intervals don't overlap, so we're pretty confident that, yeah, that's less than sea level rise. Blue is we're pretty confident that it's greater than sea level rise. Uh, most people want to see red and green for this stuff, but it's not colorblind friendly, so we've made the decision to use red and blue instead, and I'm trying to get people used to that. But these are the colors to stick in your mind. Next, please. And for the bigger summary graphics, it was hard to wrap our heads around how we wanted to present these things at bigger levels, and we settled on pie charts. 
because you can just see the proportion that are generally less than sea level rise or generally greater than sea level rise. And then next, when you put those pie charts on a map, you can compare to each other across the region or even nationally, which is the next slide. You can also add in some of the other graphics I've showed you to tell reserve level stories, uh, particularly for some of these outreach tools that we're trying to develop. Um, the pie chart is a good broad overview, but then you can zoom into different levels and present the data different ways and talk about it. And again, there will be tables and all of these final reports. That's all still taking shape. Next. We have worked with data from 15 different reserves and there were 15 different formats that I received the data in. So one of the things we were asked as panelists was to share our tips for synthesizing data. And this is gonna come up again, Chris, Peter and I have had talks about this, plan time for dealing with these different data formats. One of the biggest advantages of this project is that we've taken the data from all these different starting points and we've done the heavy lifting to put it into this format that is known in some circles as tidy data. I put a couple of papers on this slide that I encourage you to check out. They're both open source, freely available, and they can help you think about data management. But we've taken the data from these 15 reserves and put it into this one format. And this format works with all of the R scripts and tools that I'm building. And even if you are not in this project, if you can put your data into this format on the right, all of this stuff works for you. And non-project people have tried it and it has worked, so that's been good news. Next. The other big tip is to collaborate well, you wanna meet people where they are. And what we have tried to do is, uh, next, Nick. One is make it easy to provide feedback. We've tried to provide a lot of different ways, not just conference calls, but Google Docs, um, emails. We're trying to make it possible for people to share their thoughts with us. Next. Part of that has involved planning for multiple levels of engagement. Some people have been able to be on every phone call. Uh, some people love reading long emails or documents and responding to them, and other people are only able to pop in every now and again. So we've tried to provide different ways for engaging all of these people because they all have valuable feedback. Next. We have also tried to give people something to respond to and lead time on it. Uh, next, there are two bullet points here, Nick, so you can just make them both show up. We tried to send out agendas about a week before to say generally what we were gonna talk about. And we tried to get out a final agenda at least a day or two before so that people could actually see some of the draft things and maybe think about it before we're on the phone talking. And then after calls, we kept Google Docs open if people wanted to provide any more feedback. Uh, next, we also have done a lot of following up with just individuals. Some people are a lot more open when you're just talking to them one-on-one -on -one and you can really dig into the data and that's also been a really valuable source of information. And I do wanna give a good shout out to Suzanne Scholl at Padilla Bay who has helped implement all of these steps. She was the collaborative lead on this project and has really helped engage all of our various users. Next. So this is my last slide. We've had a lot of involvement, a lot of good feedback, not just from the NEARS, but from external agencies as well. So thank you to everyone who's contributed. There's a link here to sign up for our email list. The project will wrap up in February and we'll have some webinars, we'll release the tools, and all of the products will be archived on the CDMO's website. So you can sign up for our email list if you wanna be notified of those. And there's my email address as well. So I think I will leave it at that, and I'm happy to dive into any more of this in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. We're gonna hold off on answering questions until the end of the webinar, just as a reminder, but feel free to type in questions at any point. One second while we switch back to the other presentation. All right, next up, we're going to hear from another team that received a one-year grant to analyze marsh vegetation data from the four reserves in New England. 
Chris Peter is the research coordinator with the Great Bay Reserve in New Hampshire, and David Burdick is a professor at the University of New Hampshire and has collaborated with the reserve system for many years. I'll go ahead and pass it to Chris now. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Nick um, and not to be confused with Grand Bays and Mississippi Great Bays in New Hampshire, and also not to be confused with the other Chris who was pictured also featured on a boat with sunglasses and a hat leading into the water, um, just, just to kind of keep you guys on your toes. Uh, fully coincidental. So similar to Kim's project, we're looking at tidal marsh data throughout the system, the NIRS data. Um, different than her, we're focusing on the plant community and focusing on a region, New England. And our project goals are pretty simple. Um, how are our marshes faring in this unprecedented level of sea level rise? And how can we create um, a guide or a template to, to facilitate more data uh, wrangling, more standardization, more QA, more visualizations and analysis that can be transferred to other reserves, um, other scales, regional and national scales, and even outside of the nearest system. So those are our project goals. And we had a fantastic project team from uh, comprised of all the reserves in New England, as well as advisors um, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and from Elkhorn Slough in California. Um, and just to give, give you guys a little bit of orientation why I see two people on this video here, uh, Dave and I are tagged to you in this talk, and I'm gonna, I drew this short, ugly straw. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, the methods and the data wrangling, and Dave drew the shiny, um, nice metal straw, and he's going to be talking about the, uh, the project results and the, and the summary. Um, and with that, I'll just lead into the next slide. So our, our project focused on four reserves, eight marshes across eight years from 2010 to 2017, and a heck of a lot of data and species. Um, like Kim, we have a lot of data formats. We have four reserves, we actually have six different formats. One reserve surprised, surprised us with three different formats. Um, and we also have different methods for, for parameters. From, depending on what we're collecting, we have multiple ways of collecting it. Um, and with that, I'll advance to the next slide. Please. Um, so there's many different uh, ways to document plant community. You can use plant cover, which is the, the top line, or, or um, plant heights, or plant counts. And we found differences in all three of these. Um, the one that we're focusing on that seemed to be the biggest roadblock was estimating plant cover, uh, either with point intercept that's featured on the top left, uh, which is a grid, and, uh, and using dowels that intersect plants, or cover categories. And uh, on the top right, there is a um, picture of using ocular cover, which is simply measurements, um, estimates using visual estimates. And we found that half the reserves in New England use point intercept and the other half used uh, ocular cover. And at the national stage, we're seeing basically a 50-50 split in the reserve system. And I was curious, um, since we have a lot of participants here, to see what other people are using. So I think we have a poll question queued up. Yep, we perfectly do. Um, so if you're involved in any type of marsh monitoring, uh, which method do you employ? Um, either use or fund or connect with just spiritually? Um, and I'll just, uh, just take a couple of seconds here to let people answer. Pretty simple question, so I won't dwell on it too, too long. So please uh, queue up if you're, if you're multitasking on answering this question. Okay, great. So it's a little bit different uh, at this level, you know, not quite a 50-50 split. Uh, very interesting to note. All right, and we're going to move on. So I did want to mention that we um, use permanent one meter squared plots that are transect-based, uh, three to six transects that, that go from the upland edge to the water's uh, main tidal source. Um, and we have some differences in methods uh, that that go beyond just cover heights and counts, um, even how to treat rack. Um, do you just leave the rack there in measurement? Do you move it in measurement? We also have differences in transect length and how you measure the ecotone and how you determine the marsh zone, or even how you deal with dead plants. Um, so we have these challenges, and I'm gonna focus on the most uh, uh, ubiquitous one of, of cover. So if we move to the next slide, I can dive into that. So here's just a, some images of uh, a plot um, being monitored both with point intercept on the bottom left and aqua cover on the bottom right. And even with the simple plot, we see some major differences with the alternate flora at 
you know, much higher in point intercept, 84 or 60 percent, and bear cover is much lower in point intercept. And we saw this pattern exist not just in this one plot, but we did this over 100 plots across all four reserves, and we found the same general pattern of point intercept being um, est having estimates lower in bear and dead category, and um, always higher in live categories, live cover categories. Um, and so we tried to figure a way how to reconcile this, which leads me to the next slide. So the most obvious way is to make everything to 100 points. So we use 50-point uh, grids, and we just multiply them to, and that's what we use to compare octocover versus point intercept to derive to see these significant differences. Um, a step further would be to take that data and then normalize it to 100%, as oftentimes when there's more than one species, you get point intercepts that lead to over 100, 200, 300%, so you have to normalize those down. We decide not to normalize bear and dead because they are already underestimated by point intercept. And lastly, we created a third new different method on, on making these two data sets talk, and it, we use uh, basically a statistical relationship with regression. Um, and we did that not just across all species, we broke them out into, into different cover categories. And um, actually, actually they'll be featured in the next slide. So our cover categories are um, based purely off of morphology, not ecology. Uh, for instance, the shrub and tree category would, would um, hold a lot of saplings and, and marsh uh, border shrubs like Iva or Baccarus or maybe like uh, a red maple. And the thin grass category would have short, thin, lawn-like grasses like the stickless piccata or spartata patens. And we created these relationships, regressions, um, for all these categories. And came up with significant and pretty um, tight uh, results, ranging from 0.6 to 0.9 R squared ratio. So we were quite happy with the, the way that to reduce variance by splitting up into these groups. And the um, last slide I have is one of the, some of the results. So, just orientate you to this graph. Um, the y-axis is just cover, and the x-axis is all the different morphological archetypes. And the green is the ocular cover, which we're trying to put our, our point intercept closer to, and all the blue shades are the different methods. Note that the dark blue method, uh, black two bars, is the method using the regressions and morphological archetypes, and it was, in every instance, the closest to ocular cover. It, I do want to note that normalized data transformation um, in two instances was tied with regressions for being as close statistically. And we looked at this using a two-way ANOVA. We looked at this using a paired t-test. Um, and it's important to note that this isn't perfect. There are still some major differences in a couple of categories, the, the two on the far left, broad and tall grass and bare and dead. Um, so yes, we can make these two data sets talk to each other better, but it is still better to use the same method. And with that, uh, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Dave to talk about results. Next slide. Thanks, Chris, uh, for setting me up. Let's dig into uh, vegetation changes over time using univariate analysis of the reserve at the reserve level. Uh, so next slide. And uh, Great Bay in New Hampshire has monitors three different marshes, uh, Bunker Creek, Great Bay Farms, and Sandy Point. And what we're looking at here is Spartina alternifloor cover on the y-axis on these three marshes and over time on the x-axis from 2010 to 2017. Uh, we looked at plots in the low marsh, which is a red line. Sorry about the red and the green. Uh, transition plots are the, are the green line. Those are both the upper two lines in every single marsh because that's where most of the alternate floor is. And then high marsh is shown as a blue line and upland edge is a purple line. But what I want to point out here is that in every marsh, in every case, there was more Spartina alternate floor or cord grass in the low marsh when we started in 2010. And then by 2017, there was more Spartina alternate floor cover in the transition marsh than in the low marsh. So the low marsh is being drowned out and the Cord grass is moving into the transition zone in the high marsh. Um, you can see the model is uh, really accurate uh, in terms of uh, un, uh, un, unascribed errors. The unascribed error is very small at only 1%. So, um, so let's move over to um, the larger picture with the next slide. Great. 
all four reserves, and this has tons of scatter, as you can see. But that scatter is dealt with by site and habitat, um, assigning a site and habitat to each plot. So these are all the all the data from all the plots showing Altanaflora on the left and Spartina patens on the right. And if you look at the Altanaflora on the left, that green line, that upper green line is the low marsh. You can see it declines in Altanaflora in the low marsh as it's being drowned out. And in the high marsh, um, the red line under the graph on the right shows Spartina patens with a dramatic decline of over 10% over just eight years just a huge decline in New England marshes on losing our high marsh grass. This trend keeps up. We're not going to have much. Uh, I wanted to point out also that the green dots on the right graph is Spartina patens in the low marsh. So we actually started in 2010 with quite a few plots having Spartina patens in the low marsh. But if you look in 2017, there's no plots with any Spartina patens in the low marsh left. Next slide. So we can um, take these, uh, all of these uh, analyses, and we can uh, make some points here. So we're using a general general model that's analysis of covariance with year as our covariable, and site and habitat as our main um, independent variables that we uh, include uh, two-way interactions of with year. So the the marsh that you take collect the sample for from is all different. So all the marshes are different. Doesn't matter which reserve you're at. The marshes within a reserve are more different than between reserves in some cases. But the habitat you collect the sample from is really important. And once you have those, this model works really well. You can see the R square varies from 0.89 to 0.99. And uh, so we're really uh, finding that there's not a lot of year-to-year -year variability that's random. Uh, most of it is fairly linear and going one direction. And we can use dependent variables in univariate analysis. We can have dependent variables of species like Altanaflora patents. We could make a ratio of species. We could include perhaps all the narrow leaf grasses like the stickless juncus and patents and create a new variable out of that or species richness. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, flexibility with these univariate analyses. Okay, so that's the univariate analysis. Let's jump to multivariate analysis for the last few minutes. So the next slide shows uh, Kenny Raposa looking at his high marsh and doing a point intercept count of his high marsh. What, what multivariate analysis does is it looks at the whole plant community of an observation and classifies, uh, categorizes that plant community for that observation. So for every plot and every year, it creates a different plant community. So we use primer to uh, analyze the data and um, the analysis of similarity uh, shows the, the biggest differences in the high marsh, as you can see in the small uh, table in the upper right. So our high marsh is 0 0.001 uh, likelihood of being different, different communities, change, that high marsh community changing over time. And if you look in the non-dimension, the non-metric multidimensional scaling shows a two-dimensional graph of all of those data from 2010 to 2013 and 2017. We've skipped the other years in between just to get the, so you get the idea that it's really unidirectional. It's going from the lower left to the upper right with more bare and alternate floor in the high marsh and less patents and less disticulous spagata in the high marsh. And one of the cool things you can do uh, that Chris Peter did with this analysis is he did pairwise tests for every year. So if you look in the small table in the lower part of the gra uh, this image, you can see the first comparison is 2010 to 11, 2010 to 12. So he kept doing that for each year. And you can see by the fifth year, 2010 to 2014, it becomes significant at 0 0.32. So that's that shows that it only took five years to show significant differences in these plant communities. Next slide. So we zoom back up to all four reserves, and this is great uh, two-dimensional graph from the non-metric multidimensional scaling showing the different habitats. Remember that we signed habitats. And we have low marsh, the transition zone, high marsh, and the upland all sort of cluster out very nicely. 
And so if we zoom into the low marsh with the next slide, this is just the low marsh data. You can see that the data change uh, from 2010 in the greens to 2017 in the blues are all going the same direction. And what it shows is they're all losing. This is the low marsh now. They're all losing alternaflora, and it's being replaced. It's, it's drowning, essentially, being replaced by water and bare soil and dead plants. Next. So to recap, uh, it's pretty clear that these results from this uh, national network of data collection applied just to New England uh, shows marshes are changing, and they're changing pretty dramatically in all of our marshes. It's more so in the southern marshes that have smaller tidal ranges, but they are changing nonetheless. And you can see the change using something as simple as a, a photo a photo of your plots every year, like Kenny Raposa has done here between 2011 and 2016, showing a dramatic loss of high marsh plants in one of his marshes. In terms of sensitivity, that's a big question from our stakeholders. They want to know what's the most sensitive, and it's Spartina in New England because that's the one that's uh, Spartina alternaflora and Payton, so the two species that are likely to be in almost all the plots. One or the other of those species are likely to be in all your plots. So that's an important consideration. You want something that's in all your plots to be, uh, sent, to be sensitive. And also, if you have a transition a set of transition plots between low and high marsh, that was the most sensitive as well. We, lessons learned, we found we had inconsistent methods, uh, a lot of inconsistent methods, and we worked probably 90% of the time, Chris can tell you, uh, of the data wrangling with Bree Fischella uh, and, and Chris getting these methods to sync up to make these comparisons. So in terms of recommendations, we'd really like to have more um, unit, um, we'd like to unify more of the protocols and I think we, our data can really lead to information and management action in the future. Our, our project is, is just about over, just ended last week, and we hope to get all our reports out uh, in the next month. Thanks very much. Thank you to Chris and David. As before, we'll hold questions till the end, but remember you can input questions at any time into the GoToWebinar console. To help kick off the Q&A and discussion, Got some comments from Dwayne Porter. Dwayne Porter is a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. He is also the director of the Centralized Data Management Office, which helps process and archive monitoring data from across the reserve system. Dwayne. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. And a big thanks to Ken and Chris and David for those very enlightening presentations. And I'd like to take a couple minutes and reflect back on the projects and offer up a couple of other ideas is and then open this up for question and answers. So if we go to the, the next bullet and actually click down a couple more, get them all in there at one time. So listening through the presentations by Kim and Chris and David, I first have to offer up a big thanks to Kim. So being colorblind myself, I'm very appreciative of your, of your project's consideration of those of us that are color challenged. And so, a couple of the, the themes that came out of this, one, whether we call it data wrangling, as Chris and David referred to, or data tidying, tidying, if that's a word, as Kim referred to, takes time, effort, and resources. And I'm gonna come back with a question about that in just a couple of minutes. And the other thing that is so exciting to me, sitting in a school of public health, we focus on community-based research and research-based research-based learning. And community-based research cannot be done in a vacuum. It requires the collaboration of a wide variety of partners. And it's important to, to recognize that both of these projects also recognize that and they engage their end users from the very beginning through the very end and oftentimes with the transfer of what has been developed to the end users. And as David just pointed out, you know, the analyses that have been done to date really are just the tip of the iceberg. As we start to identify ways in which we can begin to first assimilate, assess, and then integrate data to address questions we hadn't thought of before because of the availability of high quality data, the, the iceberg that is underwater is truly 
significantly larger than what we've done to date. So next, please. And a couple more. Click on down and four more. I know that Chris alluded to the diversity of our audience, but I think it's worth mentioning this again, pointing out that we had pretty significant representation from all around the country, plus one international participant. And it wasn't, it is not just limited to the coastal regions where we have our reserve system, but the fact that we have seven federal agencies that are participating today, and I counted at least 11 different states are represented, and a wide variety of academic institutions, about um, a little over, not quite half, but close to half of the reserves are, or at least more, more than a third are on the webinar today, and a wide range of NGOs. And this is indicative of the types of collaboration that are being sponsored and being supported by the Science Collaborative and the Reserve System and all of those that are participating in these projects and on the webinar today. And that in itself is a, that's something to brag about. And that's how we begin to make differences in our communities and allow us to address regional and national issues. Next, please. And so I'll talk a little bit about some potential opportunities that are out there and go to the next one. So I'll be the first to acknowledge that this slide itself is a bit NOAA centric and I'm gonna draw upon the White House summit that took place a couple of weeks ago. But the topics here really are relevant to, as I look across the list of participants today and the opportunities, these issues are relevant. So at the White House summit that took place prior to Thanksgiving, NOAA announced four new strategies to begin to support addressing the mission of NOAA, which overlaps with missions of a number of other federal agencies and any number of state and local agencies. And as we talk about opportunities for the use of monitoring data and observing data, and I'll say two things to that. One, you know, as, as we're all dealing with struggling budgets or stagnant budgets, one of the things that's become clear in congressional visits over the last couple of years is that Congress really is not strong on supporting monitoring or observing per se. Congress wants to support things that demonstrate change, that demonstrate advancement, that demonstrate addressing quality of life issues. And the opportunity you have with, we have with these partnerships is to allow us to demonstrate how we're using monitoring and observing data to affect change, positive change. Specific to activities that NOAA supports that are supported by the NEARS Science Collaborative and the NEARS of the four strategies that were released, issues of artificial intelligence and machine learning, omics, eDNA, genomics, et cetera, and cloud computing are three areas where the Science Collaborative, the Reserve System, and all the partners, including everyone on the webinar here, have an opportunity to, to make a contribution. And next slide, please. And a couple ways in which to do so. You know, what has been demonstrated by the projects today, and if you do a review of the projects that the Science Collaborative has supported and that individual reserves support, that collaborations come in all shapes and forms and sizes. And if we just take a look at the two projects that were just presented, there was a wide range in terms of the, the number and range of collaborations, but the collaborations are there and they're there from the beginning to the very end. Next. The last, I wanna go back to something that, a comment that Dr. Kincaid made at the very beginning of the, the webinar. And he talked a bit about the system-wide monitoring program 
and the role of the centralized data management office in terms of making data accessible and doing and providing visualization tools. But I want to go one step further and talk for just a minute about the, the importance and the value of what the reserve system is doing, the science collaborative is supporting, and what all of these partnerships are working towards. And the issue is data assimilation versus data integration. And I don't want to give my standard lecture on data management, but this is an important point I, I feel. There are so many data portals that are out there, and there's a number of fantastic data portals that exist that are assimilating a wide range of data. And these days, it's not only environmental data that are being assimilated, but it's also socioeconomic data, it's human health data, et cetera. And I think it's very important that we understand the difference between data assimilation and data integration. And the example that we use is that data assimilation is your grocery cart in the uh, grocery store. You get down the aisles, you're grabbing food off the shelves and you're throwing it into your grocery cart. And you get home and you take all the food and you put it in your pantry. You've assimilated a whole lot of things. Data integration is where we begin to utilize and realize the value of our monitoring and observing efforts. Data integration requires not only the high quality QAQC that all of our programs are providing, but more importantly, it provides the recipe, which is the metadata or the data documentation. And the metadata and the data documentation are the tools that allow us to make that determination as to whether or not the data that we have assimilated is appropriate, relevant, useful, and usable in addressing the issues at hand. So I encourage everyone, and I, and I realize the, the cost, the time, the effort associated with the data documentation component, but truly the data documentation is what facilitates advancing our data beyond the bounds of the original reason for which it was collected. And we all have the opportunity to do more with our own data when we do adequate, proper, great data documentation and support the integration of our own monitoring and, and observing efforts with those of others to address problems that and issues that weren't part of our original responsibility. So one more. So with that, you see the directions about how to ask a question, but if it's okay with Chris and Nick, I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question or two myself of the 10 or 12 that I wrote down here and listening to, to Kim and Chris and David. And so the first one goes back to the issue tied to, to data management and to use Kim's terminology, it was data tidying and for David, it was data wrangling. And the question I have to the two of you, what are, what were the challenges associated with data tidying and data wrangling? And how did you best address those? Since we're staring at each other blankly, I guess I'll talk first. I think challenges are, taking some of the habits that people have from using spreadsheets that make it easy to look at data, easy for humans to understand what's going on in the spreadsheet, and turning that into something that is a little more machine friendly because statistical programs don't understand color coding, for example, or two tables on a sheet. and Everybody has little different things they were doing. So just kind of dealing with each little issue and finding a format. Well, the format is fairly well defined nowadays, but getting it there was a challenge. And one of the ways I tried to address it was actually just using R to get there so that we could trace every step of the way from the original data file that was sent to the data file that I'm spitting back out. 
And I'm going to stop there and let Chris and Dave reply in case they wanted to go in a different direction. Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, excellent question. We had those, basically the same challenges as Kim. Our data is probably a little bit messier because we're dealing with different methods um, and in different data in some cases. Uh, just like I mentioned with the point intercept and ocular cover or with height, some people do the five tallest, some people do 12 random. So we have to kind of um, build uh, spreadsheets that can handle um, this type of flexibility and we can do that by making it really big and that's probably the best way to do it that, that we have looked at it. I think the way that Kim handles it is actually a better way and I'm looking forward to potentially working with her to make it more streamlined and more automated um, using, using R because there's a lot of data um, just in one marsh at one reserve a lot of data and building it out um, to the region is an incredible amount of data. So we have that same challenge and um, most of it is, is just getting it into the same format. Um, so I don't really want to belabor the points, so I'll just kind of stop there. Okay, thank you. And Chris and Nick, if it's okay, I'm going to ask one more question before I turn the Bob gentlemen for the Q&A part. And a question for David. I was looking at your table of the univariate analysis, and you pointed out the high R squares that you had for everything except for four, where you had an R square of 0.14. Any explanation as to why? It looks like the Forbes are not responding to sea level rise. It looks like they may be increasing in the high marsh in some spots and decreasing in others, but not a big change, not a unidirectional change through time. So it is really interesting, and that's just where, that was a great question, because that's where this would lead someone else. So now someone else should take that, look at that data, and look at it in a lot of different ways and see, and see if they can find out why the Forbes aren't really uh, responding over time. It's kind of interesting. I think it's kind of neat that we're not losing our Forbes species because they're, they're some of the rare wildflower type species in the marsh. Okay, thank you. So Chris and Nick, I will turn it back to you guys for the, the Q&A, if that's okay. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, just a reminder, you can submit your questions to the GoToWebinar console. We'll do our best to organize questions as they come in and direct them to the appropriate speakers. We expect that we probably won't get to all of your questions today, but please, please, please still submit them either through the GoToWebinar console or through the exit survey that you'll find when you leave the webinar session. Uh, we do have a couple questions rolling in. I think Lynn and Megan have one at least that they want to ask, so I'll turn it over to Lynn here. Yeah, we do. We've got some, some good specific questions. Um, before I jump into them, though, Chris Kincaid, did you have anything you wanted to, to add here kind of as wrap up or a, or a question on your mind, kind of the way Dwayne already uh, jumped ahead and asked a couple of his questions? Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with a couple of the audience questions here. So here's one question for you, Kim. One astute listener noticed that um, there's a, some interannual variation of about 10 millimeters, it looks like. Can you account for that? Short answer, no. <laughs> um, some of what I showed you actually, when we started measuring at our reserve, which is the reserve I mostly showed you, we used to measure quarterly. And I think everything in this was quarterly, so yes. Uh, within a year, there's definitely some seasonal variation. We have not done a deep dive into the factors for that, but just from conversations, you know, water levels matter, um, how much root mass you have going on matters under there. So that's not what we were trying to get at, but there's definitely some of that variability within a year. Um, but what we're just trying to do is say what's happening year over year over year. And one of the recommendations from our project is actually make sure that you get measurements at the same time period within a year, preferably at the same tide level so that you don't have uh, impacts from soil saturation and that kind of thing. So we're, we're working with sort of 
that'll average out over time. Okay, thanks, Kim. So I got another specific question, this one for, for Chris and David. Uh, one participant's wondering why you normalize to the ocular method. It seems to put more emphasis on the ground level at the expense of the three-dimensional structure of the grasses in the plot. Or one impression. I take this yeah, I'll take it. Um, well, one of the things we did with the ocular cover method is everything goes to 100%, so we have a boundary there. I think one of the problems with interpreting the point intercept is the lack of boundaries um, for that. So you could have 238% um, uh, abundance value, which is um, which is you know it's a little disconcerting. It's hard to know. Uh, Different, the four reserves handled bare ground, rack, and dead plants very differently. And to pick up, to pick up a point intercept choice and to try to normalize everything to that was, would have been more challenging because of that, because of that problem with other types of cover. So one of the things we really want to, uh, we wanted to show from our results is what does a ground cover look like if you wanted to take this and and use a drone to start assessing marsh cover the, the ocular cover would be most like that of, uh, of data gotten from uh, more remote sensing techniques so you can see there's several reasons none of them are really really strong except for me, from my mind, the way my mind thinks, and everyone's different, is that having the boundary of you can't get over 100% is very, it's kind of a valuable stop point for me. What do you, you got something else, Chris? <laughs> well, I would just add to that that um, our, we're just trying to make them too, too similar. So we're not putting any judgment values on them. And one, we're trying to make point intercept similar to ocular cover. And ocular cover is bound by the 100%. So if we don't bound the point intercept, and oftentimes we're going to have, you know, cover categories that are way greater than in ocular cover because you're bounded. So we have to, if we then normalize and bound them, then we're comparing relative proportions of different cover um, at a scale that's similar. And that's why we did it. Okay. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question here before the, uh, before the bottom of the hour here. Um, kind of a big big picture question here about any thoughts about the challenges of extending monitoring and analysis beyond the upper edge of the tidal marsh to try to get at questions related to marsh migration. Any thoughts on that? Um, I guess I can I can handle that one for start or at least start it. So the NEAR system does have an ecotone protocol. We actually have a couple different protocols and one of them is to establish more plots. And that could be at all different ecotones, being you know the high marsh to the upland edge, or the low marsh to the high marsh, or et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't have a consistent um, ubiquitous data set that covered that for the New England region. So we didn't look dive into the ecotone of the upland edge high marsh for this project. Um, however, when we build out, if we build out nationally or to different regions, or look into future monitoring. I think that's something we can look at and really hone in on it. There is also the challenge, though, that um, when you go to ecotones in different regions of the country, you have completely different plant communities. You could have a savanna, you could have a forest, a tidal, you know, a, a forest swamp, you could have a grassland, and that requires, I think, differences in methods. You may need plots of different scales. So at that point, uh, we have a larger challenge, but we can still face it by looking at relative metrics. So I, I think it's a future analysis we just didn't tackle for this project. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. We're looking at the time here, so maybe I'll pass it back to Nick to wrap us up. Yeah, we tried to squeeze in time for at least one more question there at the end, because I know we started a little bit past 3.30. Uh, hopefully, if anybody still has questions, you'll be able to still submit them. We'll go ahead and leave the webinar open a few minutes after our panelists. We let them go, and you can still submit questions. Or again, you can submit them via the exit survey uh, as well. So a few just quick announcements. Our next webinar is on Thursday, January 23rd in 2020. 
at 3.30 Eastern time. The webinar will focus on two groups' efforts to engage communities in role-playing simulations for the purpose of advancing climate planning in their respective regions. The speakers are Maeve Snyder and Annie Cox. So please join us for that. And you'll see some webinar announcements rolling out within the next few weeks. There will be a written product that accompanies today's discussion. Uh, we call them our webinar briefs, so there will be one for this discussion as well, which will include summary points and answer any questions that did not get answered, hopefully. A um, few products that were released recently, we do have some new panel summaries and management briefs available on the website for past webinars, including the Living Shorelines one and the Enhanced uh, and the Climate Resilience one as well. So keep an eye for those. And also the Collaborative Research Panel Summary, which is a really good resource for people who might be considering applying for any of the RFPs that are out. So keep an eye out for those as well. Those are on the website now. So with that, we'll just say uh, one big thank you to our speakers again for taking the time to be with us today and for doing such a great job. Thank you guys for being here. And we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Really appreciate the organization. Bye, everybody. Thank you.